Since 1979, there have been five major world shocks. The fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Japanese stock market, the rise of Muslim terrorism, the dot-com bust in 2000, and the financial meltdown of 2008. One private research network in Baltimore correctly predicted all these five events well before they happened. And right now, the founder of this network believes we're going to see a sixth right here in the very heart of America. The following is a direct message about what's going on and how you can protect yourself. Please stay tuned. Hi, my name is Bill Bonner. Around 35 years ago, I assembled a group of analysts, including the former head of the BBC and an Oxford scholar, to research, expose, and even predict massive world shifts. In 1987, we predicted that the Soviet Union would collapse. A few years later, that's exactly what happened. In 1989, I was personally mocked for predicting that the Japanese stock market would crash. We wrote, the long-running bull market in Tokyo may be nearing an end. Months later, the Japanese stock market crashed. It has never recovered. In 1993, we predicted the rise of Muslim terrorism, writing, quote, especially troubling for many in the West will be the rise of Islam. This could be the biggest threat to world peace in the next two decades. The bomb at the New York's World Trade Center is just a small taste of what's to come. Eight years later, in the September 11 attacks, they hit the World Trade Center again. In 2000, I sent out a note warning that a day of reckoning was at hand for the dot-com boom. That very day, the Nasdaq began a two-year 77% decline. And recently, we predicted the crash of the housing bubble in 2008, along with lenders Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Our success has allowed my once small group to grow into the largest underground research network on the planet, with 2.4 million subscribers. According to the Alliance for Audited Media, we reach more people than the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. The FBI and the CIA have even approached us for help on matters of national security. But I don't bring this up to brag. I'm here because I think we're about to see a sixth major shock. One more important than anything my firm has dealt with, rivaling and even surpassing the fall of the Soviet Union. Except that this time, it won't be happening halfway around the world. We won't be watching it on CNN or Fox News from the comfort of our living rooms. The epicenter of this next great world shift will be right here in America. Now I must warn you that some of the facts I'm about to tell you may seem incredible, yet they are true. In fact, we've recently passed what I believe to be the point of no return which means that a crisis is now inevitable and unstoppable. It will start small. Maybe you'll try to get money out of an ATM machine one day and find that it isn't working. Maybe you'll be at a restaurant with your wife, and when the check comes, your credit card will be denied. You call your bank. You get a pre-recorded message from some government agency you don't recognize. As I said, it will start small. But let me pause here for a second, because I sense you may have some questions about me and my firm. After all, you're probably wondering why you've never heard of a news and research network bigger than the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, especially one with an unmatched track record. The name of our firm is Agora Incorporated, and despite our size, we operate very privately and we only share our research and news directly with our private subscribers. We don't own a cable channel or a single newspaper. 
We don't buy splashy ads in news magazines. We don't sponsor sports stadiums or anything like that. We keep a very low profile. Of course, our success has not gone unnoticed. The CIA actually came to us to convince me to use Agora as a front for their international operations. In case you're wondering, I said no. In our 35 years, we've grown into the biggest firm of our kind on the planet, operating across 20 different countries with 2.5 million subscribers worldwide. And we've done it by exposing and often predicting the most important events and trends in recent world history. Each time, we've been able to accurately call a major world event, especially a market crash or other type of crisis, we've given our private subscribers an important opportunity to save themselves. And that's what I want to give to you and the general public today. I've never done anything like this before. I've written three New York Times best-selling books. I've been interviewed on countless TV shows, and I've been invited to Washington to meet political leaders, yet I've never released my own private research to the general public in this way before. But then, this is possibly the greatest story and the most urgent situation of my entire career. And it's a story only I can tell, because I'm the only person in this business, possibly in the entire industry, who has been watching this situation from the very beginning. You see, what most people don't realize is that in the 1950s, the United States began switching over to an entirely new kind of economic system. And no, I'm not talking about the end of the gold standard. That happened in the 70s. This new system has allowed us to amass more wealth on paper than any other nation in history. Despite the collapse of our industrial sector in the 70s, despite our manufacturing base moving overseas, resulting in lost jobs and broken towns all over America. Despite two major market crashes in just 15 years, the new system made our economy what it is. It's what keeps our lights on, our grocery stores, shelves stocked, our gas stations fueled, our Social Security checks in the mail, and our investments producing gains. And if you've ever wondered how we managed to keep going despite every sign pointing to a coming collapse, this is it. The trouble is that over 30 years ago, I noticed a fatal flaw in this system. And as this system keeps growing, so too does the flaw. It keeps growing bigger and bigger all the time. And now, I believe we're past the point of no return. When this house of cards collapses, which it will, a systemic shock will disrupt our lives in ways you never thought possible. You will suddenly be locked out of your own bank account, unable to withdraw cash or deposit a check. Your stocks will swing wildly out of control. You won't even be able to access your Social Security money. Like a virus, it will spread to our food supply chain, causing massive shortages in the cities and suburbs. The same thing will happen to our gas network. America's highways will become quiet and empty. And one by one, every service you've come to depend on, from your bank to your grocery store to our federal government, will shut down. You won't be able to get cash, and without cash you won't be able to buy food or gasoline. And what happens to America then? As a society, we are now more than ever dependent on convenience, on free government services instead of our own hard work, on credit instead of our own hard-earned cash. What happens when people can't use their credit cards? when they can't drive to get their checks because there's no gas, when the only thing you can count on is cash, and no one seems to have any of it. 
Will you be able to rely on your neighbors, your fellow citizens? Well, lately, I'm not so sure. Now I realize that to someone who hasn't been studying this for 35 years, the idea of a serious crisis like that hitting America may not seem possible. After what I'm about to tell you, I think you'll reconsider. Quote, literally, your ATM wouldn't work. You type in your code, no money comes out. You get your paycheck, you can't cash it, close quote. Those are the words of the architect of the 2008 bank bailouts, Treasury Department insider Neil Kashkari. What he's describing is a crisis that you and I came very close to experiencing just a few years ago. If it sounds similar to what I'm describing, it's for a good reason. Former Secretary of the Treasury Tim Geithner has stated, we came exceptionally close. You could hear the fear and the panic because anybody living in that world at that time, running a business at that time, knew that we were on the edge of losing the capacity to function. This has been confirmed by former Secretary of the Treasury Hank Paulson, as well as two former congressmen. And while President Obama assured Americans that, quote, the shadow of the crisis has passed in his State of the Union address, I recently came across video footage of Janet Yellen, the current chairwoman of the Federal Reserve, openly admitting that the U.S. is still facing a very real threat. We could find ourselves in a devastating spiral, says Janet Yellen. She goes on to assure everyone that the Federal Reserve is fully in control of the situation, but the truth is that by their own standards... The Fed's policies have not worked. In fact, official records indicate that the highest levels of our government have already spent $4.5 trillion trying to contain this threat, more than we spent on World War II. It's a desperate move, and I don't think they'll be successful. As I write, the U.S. Con economy is in a slump. This is despite the biggest stimulus of new cash and credit in history. We have fewer real breadwinner jobs today than we did 15 years ago, and the typical household has less income. But let me back up for a second and explain exactly what it is we're facing and how we got here in the first place. By now, I bet you've already heard more than a few over-the-top conspiracies and wacky theories from people who don't have all the facts. Maybe you've even watched a few specific dates for the beginning of a crisis come and go, and if so, you're not alone. There are a lot of people out there who know, deep down, that something's not right in America, that it's been a different place since 2008. Yet they can't quite put their finger on what exactly is happening or what's coming next. Because it's not Obama, it's not the national debt, it's not a currency threat, there's a much deeper problem. That's why the hundreds of internet experts you've probably heard from are usually wrong. They only point at the symptoms, not the real threat. Meanwhile, the mainstream media is almost completely ignoring the danger we're in. They just don't understand it. Between that and the official recovery story coming out of Washington, it's no small wonder that the vast majority of Americans still have no idea about the threat our own government is spending trillions of dollars trying to contain. But then, that's why my company exists. That's what brings me here today, to tell you the truth as we see it. And the truth is, what's wrong with America didn't start in 2008 or in the decade before that. Let me start from the beginning. When I first discovered a terrible secret about our economy. As I mentioned before, I started out in politics. 
In Washington, D.C., I ran one of the most influential lobbying groups of its era, the National Taxpayers Union, all the while attending law school at Georgetown University in the evenings. We brought one of the largest class action lawsuits ever against the Secretary of the Treasury, and we lobbied state governments to pass balanced budget amendments. The New York Times, March 6, 1981, describes the story. The drive to propose a constitutional amendment requiring the federal budget to be balanced has started up again. The National Taxpayers Union, leading the effort nationally, said it believed that four more states could be found to pass the proposal this year. While fighting to reduce the national debt, I intended Reagan's inaugural ball. I was introduced to Ron Paul for the first time. I gave Grover Norquist, one of the most powerful lobbyists in America today, his first job in the city. I found myself having lunch with Margaret Thatcher and Milton Friedman. But frankly, I was never one for the backslapping that goes on in D.C., and I never believed enough in partisan politics or in the power of big government to fit in with the Beltway crowd. And I've since had a change of heart about our national debt. To be blunt, I no longer believe it is the greatest threat to this country. Don't get me wrong, I still think it's an important issue, and one we've been deeply involved with here at Agora. For example, our documentary on the subject, I.O.U.S.A., which includes interviews with Warren Buffett, Alan Greenspan, Ron Paul, and me, and others, was screened at the Sundance Film Festival and widely praised by critics. In fact, after seeing the film, Roger Ebert made it one of his top five documentary films of that year, writing, quote, a letter to our grandchildren. I have just seen a documentary titled I-O-U-S-A that snapped into sharp focus why your lives may not be as pleasant as ours. But here's the thing. There's only $1.2 trillion worth of actual dollars, physical money, in the entire world. We can't be sure how much of that is actually here in the U.S., Estimates hold that some 50% to 75% of our money is in overseas bank accounts or held by foreign governments. And a lot of what is left in the States is called dead money. It's stuffed in mattresses and safety deposit boxes. In fact, the amount of U.S. dollars being hoarded this way, that is to say the amount of dead money, is now at an all-time high. All in all, there might be as little as 250 billion actual U.S. dollars circulating in the United States. Imagine what happens as lenders try to redeem $50 trillion worth of credit, and there's only 250 billion to go around. You go to your ATM, you ask for cash, but there isn't any cash left. Suppose you have a 10,000 line of credit on your card. If the credit system doesn't work, you might as well be flat broke. Dollars become ultra-scarce. Prices skyrocket. Banks go under. In fact, it would only take about three hours for our entire country to shut down. I know that must sound impossible, but I know this for a fact. You see, the last time our credit system came to the verge of collapse, that's exactly what nearly happened. I know, I was watching. So was my whole network of analysts and researchers all over the globe. I quote, Tonight, I want you to go to the ATM machine, and I want you to draw out everything it will let you take. That's a quote from Senator Richard Burr, North Carolina chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. On Friday in 2008, he called his wife, Brooke, to tell her that he wasn't coming home that weekend. He had urgent business in D.C. He also gave her one very important instruction. Go to an ATM, take out everything you can. Out in California, the CEO of PIMCO, the largest mutual fund in the world, was telling his wife the same thing. It's a quote. I said 
Just go to the ATM. I'm not sure the banks are going to open tomorrow. And she said to me, you must be kidding. I said, no. I'll bet that sounds extreme. But what you may not know is at the time, the U.S. was just hours away from a total systemic shock. At 11 a.m., the Federal Reserve had noticed hundreds of billions of dollars starting to disappear from the American economy. A massive loss of faith in the system had prompted big players to get their money out while they still could. In response, the government began injecting billions to, quote, liquefy the system. And it watched helplessly as that money vanished without a trace. Congressman Paul Kanjorski remembers panicked meetings with Secretary of the Treasury Hank Paulson and Chairman of the Federal Reserve Ben Bernanke behind closed doors in Washington that day. He would later admit that if not for one last-ditch effort, the entire United States of America would have gone dead in the water by 2 p.m. that afternoon. Shocking, I know, especially because most people still don't realize how close we came to a full-scale shutdown, or how close we are still. You see, this situation never actually got resolved. Instead, it got worse. A McKinsey study tells us that there's $57 trillion more debt today than there was in 2007, and it's growing. In fact, it's being artificially pumped up by the Federal Reserve and other central banks. As you can see from the chart above, our current credit system started around 1950. In the late 70s, traditional American industries such as cars, steel, televisions, radios, even computers moved overseas. Credit came in and replaced traditional wage increases as a way to prop up our economy. That's what triggered the massive growth phase it entered around that time. Agora warned in 1993 that it would begin to unwind, that the credit cycle would come to an end. That nearly happened in 2000, when the credit system first stalled out and the dot-coms went bust. But then, housing was there to support it. All that credit rushed into the housing market, which then shot up to meteoric levels. But when housing collapsed, there was nothing else to keep us going. That's when the Federal Reserve started buying up bonds and mortgages. Starting with a balance sheet of $700 billion before the crisis, the Federal Reserve is now on the hook for $4.5 trillion. That's how much new cash and credit it has put into the system in the last six years. Our lender of last resort, the Federal Reserve, has become too big to fail. Unfortunately, if it does, there's no higher entity that can step in, save our credit system. It has simply gotten too big. And all it takes is just one small loss of faith. A few big players start taking their money out while they still can. And then people start lining up at ATMs. And a systemic shock will paralyze the nation. Even former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan is sounding the alarm. Unless we come to grips with this problem, I'm afraid we're going to run into some kind of political crisis. In the 36 years Agora has been providing its subscribers with information, we've seen countries get hit with financial shocks like this again and again. In just the last century, I can name at least 38 events very similar to what I'm describing, but none of them has even come close to the scale of a potential collapse here in America. That's because none of these countries has ever been able to borrow so much or become so dependent on credit. We're going to see just how dependent we've become, and I'm not looking forward to it. America's unique status as the world's superpower has enabled us to keep borrowing at unheard of levels, all on the assumption that we're good for it, but we're not, and at some point someone will realize that. When Americans can no longer use their credit cards, when grocery stores are hoarding food rather than selling it, when we become stranded in our homes because there's no gasoline, when our retirements vanish, when our government benefits are cut off, 
what will happen to America as a country? I'd like to be able to say that we'll band together and take care of each other, but will we? In the 1970s, we had a near miss with a very similar kind of crisis. Our steel and auto industries began to fail, gas prices soared, riots broke out in major cities like Philadelphia, Boston, and Chicago. One woman, a teenager at the time, remembers. Working at a country gas station, she remembers being swarmed by an angry mob one day after the gas station ran out of gas. In terms of economic crisis, it was tiny compared to what we're facing today. Yet, it shook America to its very foundation. Can you imagine a full-blown collapse in today's America? Where anger at police is reaching a boiling point? Where teenagers can use the Internet to summon flash mobs in just minutes? Where half the population pays no taxes and depends on aid from the federal government? Where students, crippled by college loans, can't get jobs? Given what we just saw in Baltimore and in Ferguson, New York, Oakland, and other cities last fall, with people seizing just about any excuse to loot stores and break windows, how long do you think those same people will refrain from stealing and violence when they can't get a meal? My feeling is not very long. All this must seem incredible, but I've seen these types of crises play out again and again all over the world. Because of the nature of my business, I've lived on three continents and visited probably a hundred countries. For instance, most people think of Argentina as a poor country. What they don't know is that before America became the dominant superpower on the planet, Argentina was one of her main competitors. It was a lot like the U.S., with similar resources, a similar population, and similar spirit of free enterprise and liberty. In fact, Argentina was actually growing faster than America. Buenos Aires, its capital, was settled by immigrants from Ireland, Italy, and Germany. It combined the rich agriculture and industry of Chicago with the boulevards, parks, and buildings of Paris. A few years ago, I bought an isolated cattle ranch up in the Andes Mountains of South America, so I passed through Buenos Aires regularly on my way there, and I know the country pretty well. Walking down the streets, you'll see decaying subway trains, state-of-the-art many years ago, big, beautiful buildings covered in graffiti, windows broken, old cars, top of the line in their day, sitting junked by the side of the road. It's as if a war had broken out. Why? It was a financial crisis, very similar to what I see coming in the U.S. In fact, when you look at the damage that events like this can cause, it's no small wonder our government has already put $4.5 trillion, that is more than it costs to liberate Europe, towards stopping it. You see, human beings need to believe that things will happen more or less as they always have, that the sun will come up every morning, that plants will grow, that the rains will come. If we didn't, we couldn't plant food or buy houses or start businesses or do much of anything. Of course, believing nothing will ever change is actually a form of delusion. Totally irrational. But it's necessary for our survival. The problem, though, is that sometimes things do change, big time, and we are unprepared when really big changes are about to strike. People refuse to believe what's often right in front of them. Lawyers call this willful blindness. Psychologists call it the normalcy bias. That's why, while I was warning our subscribers about the dot-com bubble, for example, plenty of people thought it would never end. A famous book at the time, Dow 36,000, argued that the stock market was cheaper than ever. An article published in The Atlantic read, Stock prices could double, triple, or even quadruple tomorrow and still not be too high. Then suddenly the Nasdaq started falling and eventually wiped out 77% of its value. Today, I'm seeing the same willful blindness here in America. People believe that our credit economy can just keep going forever. That we can keep borrowing and spending money that really isn't there. They think debt can go up faster than income indefinitely, even though it's mathematically impossible. And now, our highest government officials are still locked in a desperate struggle to keep this system going. And the fact of the matter is, they've already used up all the tools they have. They've kept credit cheap 
by reducing interest rates to near zero. How much lower can they put the rate if the system runs into trouble? They've already expanded the Fed's balance sheet by 542% in just a few years. How much more can they do? History is full of people who thought they were the exception, just like most Americans believe today. These stories always play out the same way. People think the rules don't apply to them. They think they can get away with something that no one else has. Our credit economy is no different. The rules still apply. Credit is not real money. It's just the flip side of debt. You run up too much debt, and you go broke. And many, many Americans are about to learn this eternal truth the hard way. We can't build the biggest credit system in world history and expect it to stay standing forever. Eventually, someone loses faith. In fact, we've seen this before right here in America. In 1819, people in America started noticing that banks were always trying to get out of honoring cash deposits. They'd give you an IOU instead, supposedly as good as real money. But attempts to redeem those notes for actual money were actually blocked or stalled in some way. Suddenly, cash started to skyrocket in value, with banks desperately trying to cover up the fact that they couldn't actually honor their deposits. They didn't have enough money. When the American public, along with foreign creditors, caught on to this, a third of America's money vanished into a black hole. The Western territories ran out of cash completely. They had to switch to a barter system using grain. Real estate and land prices dropped off a cliff, as did income from rents. You couldn't sell anything because no one had the money to buy it from you. And no one would risk a loan because there wasn't necessarily enough cash to get it back. Nearly half of all the money in the country disappeared. The resulting economic collapse stretched on well into the following decade. And we were lucky, because we were young. And the collapse happened before the problem was bad enough to do permanent damage. And back then, most families were self-sufficient. And the whole economy worked on cash, not credit. Today, it's a different story. We have a credit system worth more on paper than the national wealth of most countries, and it's already starting to come apart. Ever since that 2008 morning, when the Treasury noticed billions disappearing from the U.S. economy, the Federal Reserve has been locked in a desperate struggle to keep this event at bay, and it hasn't worked. They've even been flooding the U.S. economy with more new money than ever to try to make up the shortfall. You see, the Fed's goal is to hit 2% inflation. When that happens, they'll know what they're doing is working. Except inflation won't budge. They're already doing everything they can, and now they're running out of time. By this summer, the Federal Reserve was already supposed to be raising interest rates. But the latest GDP numbers show the economy is contracting, not growing. Now the consensus is that they will keep rates low, at least till the fall. And frankly, I don't believe they'll raise rates then either because we're starting to see dollars being drained from investment funds. In just one week, $7.2 billion disappeared from U.S. stock funds, the ninth major withdrawal in the last 10 weeks. Just one fund has already seen $38 billion pulled out this year. To compare, the previous record for withdrawals was set in 2009 was just $20 billion. And Wall Street's already on edge. A note from a Bank of America analyst is now warning, correction risk will grow in the absence of fresh inflows in the coming weeks. It's not clear where this money is going, but billionaires are thought to be hoarding an average of around 600 million in cash each. That's what happens, by the way. The smart money heads for the exits first, then there's a panic. What is clear is that cash dollars are already skyrocketing in value. As we get closer and closer to this crisis, I expect more and more restrictions on your ability to deposit, to withdraw, and to use your own cash. Here's what will happen. You'll go to your ATM, but your account will be frozen. The bank will tell you it noticed a suspicious activity. What suspicious activity? You tried to take out your cash. In fact, we're already seeing this in Europe. 
Just recently, a Swiss pension fund tried to withdraw a very large amount of cash from its bank, with the idea of storing that cash in a guarded vault instead. The bank refused to give the fund its money. And when the pension fund complained, the government backed the bank. In fact, it admitted that it had been, quote, recommending that banks with cash demands act restrictively. And it's already starting to happen in the U.S. The U.S. government has started implementing public law 111147, which makes it harder for Americans to take money out of the United States and out of American banks. Banks like J.P. Morgan are no longer allowing people to store cash in safety deposit boxes. In certain American cities, Chase Bank customers are now not allowed to make cash payments on credit cards, mortgages, equity lines, and auto loans. In fact, a man who tried to pay his mortgage with cash at a Bank of America was nearly arrested. And when a reporter from the liberal Daily Cost tried to investigate, he was accused of casing the bank. From Florida to New York, states have been moving to restrict citizens from accessing and using cash. In fact, Louisiana just made it illegal to use cash to buy any precious metals, including gold. Even some in the mainstream media have started to notice what's going on. Bloomberg has reported, there's a surge of creativity around ways to drive interest rates deeper into negative territory. As this new world takes shape, cash becomes pivotal. Am I just being paranoid? Well, I hope so. Maybe it won't happen. Maybe it won't be so bad. But as you'll see in a moment, something must give. The credit economy cannot last, and it's anyone's guess just how bad it will be when it finally gives way. In America today, we're seeing protests, rioting, young people fighting with police and turning their backs on American values. A majority of people in the U.S. now favor taking some people's money to distribute to others. A majority also favor higher taxes. It's already beginning to look like a very different America from the one you and I grew up in. Today, one in five Americans do not think the U.S. will remain a single country going forward. There have already been secession movements in Texas and now in Hawaii. In fact, a consultant for the Pentagon recently revealed plans by the Chinese to provide arms to these Hawaiian separatists. And Chinese officials have actually threatened the U.S. Secretary of State, saying they would not hesitate to assert their territorial claims over the islands. According to at least one source, the U.S. military even has contingency plans in place for the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Hawaii. Meanwhile, a recent report by Pew Research finds Americans more divided than ever. But frankly, you don't need a scientific study to prove that. From the violence that ripped through Baltimore last April, to the complete dysfunction of our Congress, to the massive decline in marriage rates for our young men and women, to the increasingly vocal and sometimes violent opposition to traditional American values, I'm not sure how well America, at least as I know it, could withstand food shortages, banks closings, bonds, retirement accounts, and benefits becoming worthless. That's what would happen, because there's not enough real money, real cash, to support the standard of living that we're used to. Realize that if you collected every single dollar in the country, you'd have less money than the GDP of Finland, and not much more than the GDP of Greece. Our economy runs on credit, not cash. And in a credit crisis, which is certainly ahead, credit is the first thing to disappear. The second thing that goes is cash. And then you have real problems. I've seen cases where economic shocks like this last years, where people are cut off from their bank accounts for months at a time, where prices swing wildly out of control where strikes cripple services and shut down highways, where hospitals can't get medicine, where governments become increasingly desperate and violent. Whether this will happen today or tomorrow or a month from now, I don't know. Nobody knows. But I do know that no country in history has ever maintained the course that America is on now. I know that no one gets away with creating fake wealth 